It was early May. The remains of the 5th Division, the Airborne 1st Brigade, the Rough Puffs, and the Rangers were waiting in the city. The constant bombardment made sure that the 4,000 men remaining were all stuck underground, along with about 20,000 civilians hiding with them. The supply situation was critical. Resupply efforts had resulted in numerous helicopters and heavy lift aircraft being destroyed. Soldiers and civilians alike barely ate and could not tend to the wounded without medical supplies. At the same time, seven infantry regiments from the Communist 5th, 7th, and 9th Divisions, along with armored, artillery, and anti-aircraft units completely surrounded the city. They were making preparations for their third major assault on Anlop. The South Vietnamese prepared for the attack on the ground, while the Americans organized their war in the air. General Hollingsworth planned 18 B-52 boxes and 200 TAC air for air support. Luckily, the fighting in Gondom and Guangxi, the other two theaters of battle, had momentarily subsided. General Abrams, commander of the U.S. Assistance Command in South Vietnam, promised Hollingsworth as much air support as needed for the next few days. It was on May 8th that the resupply effort finally improved significantly. The U.S. Air Force and Vietnam Air Force were forced to use halo drops to resupply due to the presence of Strela guided missiles. Up until now, these drops had mixed results. However, American and Vietnamese riggers worked 24-hour shifts. Drop experts were flown in from Taiwan to help find any acceptable solution. The rig teams finally found the solution. Using drogue chutes instead of regular parachutes, the supplies would hit the ground accurately but not be destroyed. But it was fast enough not to be blown off course by the wind. Immediately, 140 pallets were dropped over the next two days, with 139 of them landing at the correct location. It was the breakthrough desperately needed. However, the final Pabin assault was imminent. The supply situation was only solved just shy of the next major attack. It may not have been fast enough. South of Anlop, the 21st Division was still trying to push forward, spearheaded by the 31st Arvin Regiment attempting to dislodge the Pabin 209th and 165th Regiments. The Battle of Benchmark 75 was still underway. On May 6th, the 31st attempted a series of maneuvers to try to break through. The 1st and 2nd Battalions would try to force their way around the flanks of the Eastern Group of Defenses. Two days later, on May 8th, the 3rd Battalion airlifted north of the block to apply as much pressure as possible. The following day, on April 9th, this attempted breakthrough met with disaster. The commander of the 31st Regiment was critically wounded and could not command. The maneuvers, which had been making progress up until this point, completely stalled without his leadership. Meanwhile, in Anlop, after a couple weeks of preparation, the 5th NLF Division was prepared for its attack on the city. At 5.30 a.m., there were very strong probes around the city. This lasted for two hours. Then, the North Vietnamese withdrew. Right after, the bombardment heavily increased. At this critical moment, General Hollingsworth decided to pull out Colonel Miller, the 5th Division's advisor, and replace him. Unfortunately, he was completely worn out after a month of fighting, and his working relationship with General Hung was gone. He was replaced by Colonel Omer, another experienced officer who had served in Vietnam previously. The two men were complete opposites in personality. Colonel Miller was very aggressive and proactive, whereas Colonel Omer was much more measured and technical. This new dynamic would hopefully work better with General Hung. The following day, on the morning of May 10th, Colonel Omer was flown right into Anlop via helicopter, and Colonel Miller climbed aboard to leave the battlefield. Omer was aware that Colonel Miller and General Hung's relationship was dysfunctional, but was willing to be open-minded about the South Vietnamese general. Instantly, he saw that while General Hung looked detached, he was clearly in command and never buckled. Starting in the morning, the North Vietnamese forces continuously launched probes, testing the South Vietnamese defenses. One of the probes from the east forced the 52nd Rangers to break and fall back, one of the few times the Rangers performed poorly. Gradually, the North Vietnamese withdrew and increased the artillery bombardment again. General Hollingsworth decided to add seven more Arclight boxes to the already pre-existing 18 and requested that Abrams give him a B-52 every 55 minutes. 
starting at 12.35 a.m. on May 11th, the North Vietnamese increased the bombardment heavily. A shell fell every 5 seconds. All of this fell into a 1,000 by 1,500 yard area. 7,500 shells fell on South Vietnamese positions for 4 hours, then stopped completely at 4.30 a.m. It was completely quiet for 30 minutes. For the defenders, they knew that the artillery was letting up for the infantry and tanks to start moving forward. At 5 a.m., the bombardment recommenced, but this time supporting the full combined arms assaults from all sides. These assaults focused on the north and northwest, intending to cut the South Vietnamese in half. 40 tanks spearheaded the attack. The 275th Regiment assaulted the 81st Airborne Rangers and managed to force them back. Three tanks broke through the front lines, but were eventually hunted down and destroyed. From the west, the 272nd Pavan Regiment smashed into the 7th Arvind Regiment and forced its 3rd Battalion back. Two tanks were destroyed by the soldiers, but the North Vietnamese pushed within 300 meters of the 5th Division HQ. Other North Vietnamese units attacked the Rough Puffs, Task Force 52, and the rest of the Airborne, but did not gain much ground. However, in the two major assaults, the North Vietnamese formed two large salients and continued to pour men and tanks in to try to join them together and divide the South Vietnamese forces in two. American airstrikes continued to provide direct support for the South Vietnamese, but the North Vietnamese had a new weapon deployed. The SA-7 Strela guided anti-aircraft missile was used throughout the day against helicopters and attack aircraft. Some pilots previously reported it before, but this was the first time it was confirmed concretely. With the addition of the Strela, anything flying under 10,000 feet was at serious risk of being shot out of the sky. Up until now, it was only seen in i Corps. Even then, strike aircraft continued their support at maximum strength. Without artillery, if air support couldn't come in, defeat on the ground was guaranteed. In addition to the Strela missiles, 23mm and 37mm AA cannons, along with ZSU-57 anti-aircraft tanks, were brought in to try to shut out the airstrikes. With this air cover, the North Vietnamese forces were on the brink of being victorious. The two salients were just a couple hundred meters from each other. If they managed to link up, then the South Vietnamese forces could be destroyed by crushing each of the halves one after the other. Fortunately, when the 271st Regiment had almost reached the 5th Division HQ, they attacked northeast instead of southeast, taking the public works building instead. It was a critical mistake. If this force had proceeded towards the command post, it probably would have won the battle. General Hung and his new advisor determined the enemy's intent to divide and conquer. He immediately ordered the 5th Airborne off of the southern perimeter and into the city. They followed these orders immediately and stopped the salients dead in their track. The US Air Force AC-130s and Vietnam Air Force A-1 Sky Raiders started to focus on the salients when they were stalled, forcing them back. It was close enough that a T-54 had managed to start firing directly on the 5th Division command post, but an American A-37 destroyed it. The North Vietnamese assaults were shattered by the end of the afternoon. The attacks could not make any more progress. All 40 tanks that participated in the assault were verified to have been destroyed or abandoned. 297 direct airstrikes were called in throughout the day to keep the North Vietnamese back. The prearranged arc lights were devastating, two of which were redirected at the last second to save nearby South Vietnamese units. All of this added up to success for the South Vietnamese soldiers on the ground. Even then, heavy anti-aircraft fire managed to shoot down a Vietnam Air Force A-1, an A-37, two Cobras, and two FAC-02s. While Anlop was facing the brunt of his own North Vietnamese full-scale assault, the rescuing force, stuck trying to force its way up Highway 13, faced its own disasters. The 31st Regiment was operating blind without the directions of its commander and could not push forward. Part of the 2nd Battalion of the 32nd Regiment was overrun by a Pavan attack, resulting in the battalion 2nd in command being killed with his American advisor. On the following day, May 12th, command of the 31st Regiment was given to the 32nd Regiment commander to try to salvage the situation and restart progress towards Anlop. Back in the city, the Pavan Regiments launched another major assault throughout the Anlop perimeter. Tanks started to break through, but fortunately for the South Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese had to stall their bombardment to make sure that they didn't hit their own tanks. 
South Vietnamese soldiers immediately ran out to hunt tanks and engage the North Vietnamese in close quarters combat. The elite 81st Airborne Rangers at one point saw a column of T-54s approaching from the east along Route 303. The Airborne Rangers knew it would have to cross a bridge and made a plan to wait for the first tank to reach the middle of the bridge, then destroy it. They moved right next to the bridge and shot six M72 rockets right into the side, stopping it and the column get in their tracks. That night, bad weather grounded the tactical strikes. Taking advantage of this, Haven launched major assaults with PT-76s from the north and east, infantry engaging from all directions. The tanks stayed back to provide direct fire support. Hollingsworth immediately compensated for the lack of direct strike aircraft with six arc lights extremely close to friendly position. Then the weather cleared up. At midnight, a couple of AC-130 Spectres flew in to provide fire support. After May the 11th and 12th, the heavy bombardment continued, but the North Vietnamese did not have the manpower and materiel to launch any more all-out assaults like before. At 1.45 a.m. on May 14th, South Vietnamese soldiers spotted movement and received tank fire from the west. Three arc lights at that location immediately silenced the threat. Another attempted assault was stopped by an arc light. Even then, throughout May 13th and 14th, the North Vietnamese kept hold of Antelope's northern half. By May 15th, the North Vietnamese forces had withdrawn a little bit back from Anlop. They simply could not attack anymore. The bombardment calmed down. The third attempt by the People's Army of Vietnam to seize Anlop was finally over. However, the siege would continue. While the city itself stood, Pavan were definitely not going to give up. If they couldn't seize it by force, they could definitely try to whittle the defenders down. B-2 front leadership decided to switch to a strategy of besieging, wearing down, and destroying enemy personnel. Pavan redeployed its units accordingly. Fortunately for the South Vietnamese, resupply had returned to a steady routine. Even with the North Vietnamese change in strategy, they were not at risk of being starved into defeat. The halo drops with the drove shoots guaranteed that Anlop would hold, for now. Just as the attacks relented on the city, the 21st Division finally managed to break up the defensive positions of the 209th Regiment on May 13th. The Battle of Benchmark 75 was finally over, but the 21st Division was still 17 kilometers away from Antelope. They continued to push northwards. However, they would find that the reinforced 165th and the remainder of the 209th Regiments had taken up new positions just south of the Tao Old Stream. Unfortunately, this stream crossed Highway 13 with a single bridge over it. The stream also created a swamp around it that was very difficult to cross. The defenses consisted of interweaved, triangular bunkered positions, all connected by trenches and telephone lines. It was a formal defense in depth. Trying to break through these defenses would become a meat grinder very similar to that of World War I. In the jungle, maneuver warfare was meaningless. The change in strategy to strangling Anlop was being carried out. The North Vietnamese had pulled back from Anlop, but these units were not just withdrawn from Binh Lom province. Rather, they were sent straight south to stop the 21st Division. The 7th Pavan Division's Recon Company, the 94th Sapper Company, and the 41st Anti-Tank Company arrived at Dao O to hold the line. On May 14th, the South Vietnamese advance completely ground to a halt at the bridge, and no amount of arc lights, tactical airstrikes, and artillery could help break through. Even then, the North Vietnamese took heavy casualties as well. The Battle of Dao O Bridge had just started and would be the longest, deadliest engagement on Highway 13. The fierce fighting would continue for weeks as the South Vietnamese men could only gain 50 meters on some days and no ground at all on others. Dao O would continue for 38 continuous days of fighting, well into June. However, the North Vietnamese couldn't do much either other than hold on. Well into the engagement, on May 23rd, they attempted to launch a counterattack of infantry and tanks. An AC-130 Spectre happened to be in the area and destroyed the tanks, forcing the infantry to retreat back to the defensive line. At Anlop, on the same day, an isolated attack of 6-8 to eight tanks was launched from the south without infantry support. US Marine F-4s destroyed several of the tanks, and South Vietnamese men destroyed the rest. Another isolated assault on the 8th Airborne of 8 tanks was stopped and crushed. The last tank pretended to be dead, 
but then restarted with two airborne standing right on top of it. Those airborne soldiers eventually managed to pry the hatch open and throw a grenade in, killing the crew. For General Nguyen Ban Min, commander of 3 Corps, it was clear that Anlop was spared, but the situation definitely wasn't getting any better. Anlop still needed to be relinked up with the rest of 3 Corps. Fortunately, two months into the Easter Offensive, the South Vietnamese Joint General Staff concluded that North Vietnam only had attacks planned for I, II, and III Corps. IV Corps in the Mekong Delta was relatively free from major assaults. And in mid-May, General Min was just granted operational control of a regiment from the 9th Arvin Division from the Mekong Delta, the 15th Regiment. Both the men at Dao Ol and Anlop desperately needed artillery support. General Hollingsworth advised General Min to establish a fire support base at Dun Kai, right between both locations. On May 15th, the 21st Division's 9th Armored Cavalry Regiment, the 15th Regiment's 1st Battalion, and three howitzers started to force march around the east side of Dao Ol Bridge around Pavan defenses. Simultaneously, the 15th 2nd Battalion were airlifted slightly east of Tun Kai and moved into position. Over the next two days, Vietnam and US Air Force heavy lift helicopters would fly in 11 105mm and 4 155mm howitzers, as well as ammunition to the new Long Phi or Flying Dragon FSB. A couple of battalions from the 21st Division's 33rd Regiment arrived by land later on. On May 18th, the FSB was fully secured. The last battalion of the 15th Regiment arrived. Task Force 15, composed of parts of the 15th Regiment, started to push northwards towards Anlop. Task Force 15 pushed along the west side of Highway 13, while the 33rd Regiment men pushed along the east side. This was the turning point in Anlop's rescue mission that was desperately needed, and the city's defenders experienced a significant morale boost. Help was finally on the way again. The North Vietnamese realized this. Immediately, they pulled the 141st Pavan Regiment back from Anlop and sent them straight to assault the FSB with three tanks on May 20th. The assault was repulsed by the end of May 22nd, and the North Vietnamese immediately started bombarding the FSB with mortars, rockets, and artillery, inflicting heavy casualties. Even then, the FSB continued to stand firm. Unfortunately for the North Vietnamese, it was pulling back the 141st Regiment from Anlop that guaranteed the city's survival. With the FSB still operational, the North Vietnamese decided to attack Task Force 15 one kilometer away from Tan Bin village with heavy artillery fire on May 22nd. It caused major casualties, and the North Vietnamese men directly assaulted the task force directly with infantry, but were repulsed with 14 dead. Task Force 15 continued to push north towards Anlop. On May 24th, while the 9th Cavalry Squadron was returning back to the Long Phi FSB with wounded, the 141st Regiment managed to ambush them and destroy 23 vehicles with recoilless rifles and RPGs. On May 25th, Task Force 15 itself got bogged down in trying to uproot Pavan defensive positions between them and Anlop. Due to the fierce fighting, only 239 men of Task Force 15 were still combat effective. The 33rd Regiment itself pushed a bit further, but were stopped by heavy Pavan resistance. The men pushing from Dun Tai base were now stuck trying to reach Anlop as well. The hope for relief inside the city was dashed, and morale dissipated. The 21st Arvin Division was stuck again. While the North Vietnamese attempts to take Anlop had failed, the battle was far from over.